All right. Well, thanks uh, for inviting me to speak to the class and uh, for letting me speak on this topic. As you look up at the title, you might think, well, it's interesting. It's different. You know, why is he talking about this? And I'll, I'll just give you a brief background. Um, when I joined the National Weather Service in 1985, uh, and really throughout much of the first 10, 15 years of my career, all of our challenges were looked at as either science or technology challenges. Is our scientific understanding where it needs to be? Do we have the technology, radar, satellite, um, observation, other observational tools to really do our job well? And there were some of us um, working in the Norman office in the late 80s, um, early 90s, that began to realize that there's really more to it. And while people would acknowledge it, it wasn't given maybe the focus it deserved. Um, and that's the human contribution, the human factors aspect of it. And so I sort of got interested in that. I also have a little bit of a background in psychology and began to realize pretty quickly that decisions are made by people using science and technology. And to ignore the human aspect of that was really doing a disservice, not only uh, to those in the office, but to the organization as a whole in terms of thinking, how do we prepare forecasters to make decisions under time pressure? And so a few years after that, I had the opportunity to work in a series of workshops that were, they started out being taught here in Norman. Most of them were taught, thankfully, in Boulder, Colorado. So that meant four times a year I got to go to Boulder for a week and, and hang out there and teach uh, these courses called Warning Decision Making. And it was just about the human aspects of the decision-making process. We talked about science and technology, but really it was about how do humans make decisions under time pressure. And so I asked Ariel if I could talk about this. He graciously agreed. And you know, even though I'm not sure how many of you plan on a career or at least starting a career in operational meteorology, I don't think it matters whether uh, you do that or something else with your, um, or your professional career after college. I think these concepts will be potentially useful. So uh, what I want to talk about today includes what we can learn from other disciplines. I'm really fascinated by um, decision making in other realms, aviation, emergency medicine, uh, firefighting, um, law enforcement. There's just so many others where decisions are made quickly with imperfect information, time pressure is great, and there is substantial uh, impacts if you make the wrong decision. And a lot of those really sort of relate to the challenges we face in meteorology. So we'll look at some other disciplines. What can we learn from them? Turns out some of what we can learn will uh, be the importance of communication, the importance of something called situation awareness. How many of you have heard that phrase before? Pretty well known today. In the late 80s, early 90s, it was really limited to uh, battleground uh, decision making and also aviation. In fact, where I first saw this term had to do with the, air, uh, the crash of an aircraft into the side of a mountain in Colombia. It's what they refer to in aviation as CFIT, controlled flight into terrain. And what had happened was the crew got distracted by uh, an alarm in the cockpit, and they basically didn't notice that they were running uh, into a mountain until it happened. And to me, that's fascinating. You know, how can that happen in an environment where flying the plane should be your sole focus? And as I delved more deeply into this idea of situation awareness, I began to realize that, you know, this is the challenge we face in operational weather forecasting. And the, these same attributes that help the airline industry fly more safely can also uh, allow us to do our job more effectively as well. we'll. Talk about how do you maintain expertise in an age. Automation is almost an archaic term. It's almost one of those sci-fi sounding terms. Um, but really, more and more of weather forecasting is within the realm of automation. You know, when I was at OU in the, well, let's just say the early 80s, you know, we started our, our chase um, day by somebody would stand over the teletype. I know this really sounds old, and I do feel old sometimes when I tell the story. And someone would read out the observations. Altus, 290 at 14, gust to 28, 78 over 23, pressure, you know, 986. And we'd plot them on a map, and then we'd analyze it, and then we'd talk about it, and then we'd get in our cars and go drive. Things have changed, and automation is the big reason why. But how does that affect your ability to uh, develop expertise and to make good decisions? Fascinating topic. And then what I want to do is just put you through sort of a fun operational forecast exercise. It won't be where you will have to make decisions, though I hope you're willing to at least throw in a few thoughts, um, because this is a real event. Um, and I just want to show how some of these concepts tie together. So let me talk about some of the trends I see in, in, in weather forecasting. Some of these are pretty obvious. There's no doubt the science is advancing. Though I will say for every scientific advancement, the questions that it raises uh, often pose as much of a challenge as, um, as the answers or the knowledge itself. 
Um, there's been progress in computing. When I started my career, we had the, uh, the barotropic model. Then we got the LFM. We were all excited about this limited fine mesh. Uh, we sometimes called it limited fine mesh, but that's another story. Um, but computing capabilities have grown tremendously, and that's led to better modeling, improved data assimilation, um, which has had a huge positive impact, mostly, on our jobs. We also have more models. You know, and there's a saying in meteorology that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the challenge as a human expert is to take and extract the information that's useful from those models, um, but not be distracted or uh, led to the wrong conclusion by the parts of it that aren't, that aren't uh, accurate or aren't uh, valid. There's also an increased societal uh, demand for information. You'll hear about some of that when Matt talks about the decision support services. But the pressure is on us as meteorologists in general, and certainly at the SPC, to get better, to provide more spatial detail, more temporal detail, uh, to go farther out into the future. We're already being asked to look at week two. Uh, seasonal forecasting efforts are underway, and I don't see that changing. There's going to be a demand for more and more information. And I've just added this slide over the past couple of years. There are also more voices than ever, and that's a huge challenge for us. Um, there were a group of teenagers somewhere in the Northeast that called themselves the Storm Prediction Center at one time. Um, their graphics were actually better than ours, so that was a bit of a challenge. Um, but, you know, if, if you were just a person looking for weather information through social media, you'd say, well, you know, who, who's the real SPC? And so when there are so many voices providing weather information, how do you stand out in that group and be the voice that people come to trust and rely on is more challenging than ever. So you've often heard the analogy about the fire hose, and the fire hose is getting bigger. It's getting bigger, but there are more of them. And I thought this picture sort of uh, captured the, the challenge as well. Lots of information coming our way, lots of decisions that have to be made, lots of voices involved, um, had to maintain the, the trusted expert and get the information out and continue to advance the science and the services really is the core of our challenge as meteorologists. And so this has led to, um, and there are a lot of books that have been written about this so-called technology human interface um, and how it manifests itself in a real weather office is that more often than not, your knowledge of how to operate the systems is as crucial as your scientific knowledge. And what I mean by that is you may have multiple software platforms. If you're the lead forecaster on a midnight shift on a weekend, there aren't technicians there who can help. And so you have to know how to do a fair amount of troubleshooting and you might think, well, that's, you know, that's, that's sort of to be expected in this modern era. It's no big deal. But it is actually a big deal when those systems start to break down at critical points. Uh, there's, the clock is ticking, storms are developing, and you've got to fix this, this issue that's arisen that's not related to the forecast itself, um, but is related to the technology that we use. And I certainly lived this most of my career in a field office. It's a little bit different at the SPC because we have a folks that are available who can dial in remotely and fix almost any problem quickly or be here within minutes. Um, but certainly in many aspects of our job, you've got to know how to fix the problems as well as make the forecast. And that can be a challenging uh, situation. In addition, systems today are, are what we refer to as tightly coupled. And that means that decisions that you make propagate downstream within seconds and can have impacts. An example, we issue a tornado watch. And let's say that um, there's a typo. It's a typo that's significant enough that we want to fix it. But when you hit the send button, once that watch leaves our office, it activates weather radios, thousands of weather radios. They're still in use, believe it or not. They're an excellent backup communication system. Uh, it's sent to smartphones. It's sent across the TV screens to web pages, literally within seconds. In the old days, pre, say, 1995, if you made a mistake, you could probably fix it before everybody knew what your decision had been and what, what the watch uh, contained. Nowadays, you've got to reissue that watch, which means you have to redistribute it, re-alarm, re-alert, and so these are tightly coupled decisions. It's an inconvenience in weather forecasting. If it's you know, aircrafts, if it's uh, nuclear um, plant operations, those kinds of mistakes can propagate quickly and can lead to disaster, but this tightly coupled aspect of, of of the technology human interface makes it such that mistakes have a higher co uh, cost, uh, greater consequences, and need to be avoided perhaps more so than ever. And this is a question that I'll propose, and we'll talk about it more later, but a lot of folks say, well, that's okay, I can multitask, I can look at models, I can talk on the phone, I can chat with the neighboring offices, but is that really possible, or is that more of an illusion? 
I have some thoughts. You can tell by the way I frame the question, but I'll get to that here in a second. So without naming names or, or events, these are sources of failure, in other words, suboptimal decision making in an operational weather environment that I've either witnessed or heard about through uh, the service assessment reports that followed. I think one of the big factors, especially in a 24-7 operation where shift work is a big part of it, is diminished situation awareness due to fatigue. You know, you've heard it said that um, going X amount of hours without sleep is the equivalent of, of being impaired by drinking you know, a couple beers or three beers. I don't know what the exact number is, and it varies for each of us. And I'm not suggesting you drink on the job, but what I am suggesting is that fatigue is a danger that we probably underestimate. Um, it's true in most aspects of life, whether you're driving or, or whatever, but it's certainly when you're on the job and um, let's say you're on the seventh of seven mid shifts, for whatever reason you didn't get a lot of sleep the day before, and this is a big weather day, fatigue is a big deal. And actually in our office in Fort Worth, we trained our forecasters, those that acted as coordinators to look for signs of fatigue, and there are signs that you can look for. And when you see that in a forecaster, switch positions, have them take a break, have them do something uh, to just give them a bit of a break from, from the job that they're doing. Um, I've seen poor decisions as a result of the, the effects of automation. Could be too much data. Um, I've seen forecasters just throw up their hands and say, you know, I, I don't know what to do. Uh, their conceptual model has been proven wrong. There's so much data coming at them, and they just freeze. I've also seen less than optimal use of all the data available. And I think how this most commonly shows itself is um, you're looking at a radar that perhaps is the radar near where your forecast office is, but there's another radar that's closer that gives you a better view of a storm. And you might think, well, yeah, it's obvious. You'd look at that other radar. But when you're locked in at a storm that's close in and suddenly there's a storm farther out and you've got to change workstation screens, you've got to load some different data sets, it's a non-trivial process. And so using automation, using technology effectively is an important component. More so than ever, Decision making, um, certainly in the SPC, we stress internal collaboration uh, is critical. When you've got 50 years of expertise on shift with you, why would you not use that expertise to help you do your job? But to do that requires effective team communication. Part of that means no matter what your title is in the office, feel free to bring up questions, to question uh, comments made by others, and do that without fear of retribution or, you know, who am I to question so-and-so? He's been here 30 years. Well, but he's still human, uh, they can still make mistakes. So being able to communicate effectively is a big part of the challenge. Differences in decision thresholds. I'll show you what I mean by that here in the next slide. You might think it's uh, not a big deal, but, but I'll prove otherwise. Um, and then limits of remote ses uh, sensing systems such as radar. Um, you know, there are times where, especially at great ranges, radar might not show um, features signatures that are crucial, but if you know from experience that they're not going to look as strong farther out, but the environment's favorable and the past history of the storm suggests it's severe, you might be able to issue an effective warning in the absence of, of critical information uh, that might be in front of you. And then I think it's something that I see a lot is just decision biases, whether it's anchoring to recent information, whether it's um, just you've got the wrong conceptual model and you refuse to change that conceptual model, um, these play a role. So with that in mind, I want to ask you a question. This is the first informal quiz question. Among NWS warning forecasters, what do you think the most, assuming you're self-calibrated, what is the um, most frequently answered probability at which you would issue a tornado warning based on all the data you're looking at? What subjective probability would trigger your decision to go from why should I issue a warning to where should I issue that warning? What do you think the answer is? 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, right on up to 100. And if you don't know what the answer is for the forecasters, what would it be for you? If you were issuing warnings at WFO Little Rock today, what subjective probability would cause you to issue a tornado warning for, say, Little Rock? So, just to clarify that question, you're thinking like there's a 40% chance that there's a tornado. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So again, assuming you're, you're well calibrated subjectively, what would trigger a tornado warning for you? I have no idea what it's typically done, but for me, maybe 40%. 40 percent for you? Thanks for answering. I appreciate that. Yes? Probably 60. 60. Okay. Let me hear some other answers. This is good. I feel 50. 50. Okay. You're going to play it right, right down the middle, huh? I would say about 30, because if you got some, you know, a tornado that wasn't warned, it would be much 
worse than if it was. Right. So it's that asymmetric penalty function. Yeah, I'll go 30. 30? Anybody want to go? Yeah. 55. This is like that game show where the person who gets closest without going over wins the prize. You're just gonna, yeah. Give me 55.3%. Anybody go higher than 60? Anybody go lower than 30? Okay. This is, I forget how many dozen National Weather Service warning decision makers who came through our workshops over the course of uh, the four years, and this is, uh, this is their answer. What surprises you? Anything? Guys who said 30, win the prize, piece of pie out there, go ahead. Um, are you surprised by the 10 or the few that said 80? These are real numbers. These are people who issue warnings, you know, and you might think, well, these are deterministic warnings. There's probably, if you were to plot the decision thresholds, they'd be pretty clustered. No, wide variability. And is this variability a function of scientific interpretation or interpersonal differences and tendencies? It's probably due to their forecast. Probably due to their forecast region of past histories. So yeah, exactly. I mean, that plays an important role, right? Or how did your last warning vary? You know, it's just it's a fascinating subject, and it's incredibly complex. And what this shows is that people who do issue warnings um, as part of their job have a pretty wide variation. For me, it's between 20 and 30. And the older I get and the more warnings I issued, the lower that threshold became. And the reason is when I was a 27-year-old warning forecaster, I had these conceptual models and I had a few really pristine ones. And then the atmosphere showed me the limits of my understanding and knowledge, bit me in the wrist. And so I, I learned, right? And so I started to, okay, I did, I'm not as smart as I think I am. The radars aren't as good as I thought they were. I'm gonna be a little more cautious. And so a lot of times what I would do is if, if I couldn't decide, I would think, all right, if my family were in the path of that storm, would I want them to know about it? And sometimes that could help me make the decision. But in the end, there was always uncertainty in how you handle that as a human um, affects the decision quality. Um, we, we also asked them if population density mattered or if population mattered. Um, within this meteorological world, there's some who think, well, population doesn't matter. It's purely scientific meteorological assessment. I don't worry about population. I provide the same level of service. But the reality is we all know that you do know where the population is, and you do think about that when you're making forecast and warning decisions. So this is where I wanted to look at some other disciplines. By the way, thanks. That was a really good discussion, and I appreciated the responses I got. Um, exactly mirrors what we see in, in the National Weather Service. So my interest in, in decision making first led me into the aviation realm um, because I realized um, as I started doing some reading that aviation had dealt with some serious incidents and catastrophic accidents and as a result of that, the, the discipline and the industry learned how to do some things differently. And one of those uh, things, one of those big initiatives was called CRM, Crew Resource Management. And it was developed initially by NASA in the late 70s um, the NTSB played a role in it too because in their review of uh, after uh, accident reports, it was clear that, that the human factors aspect that went on in the, up in the cockpit was a big deal and was largely being overlooked because we were focusing on um, you know, technical uh, automation aspects of it. We weren't thinking about the people part of it. And essentially CRM addressed uh, how the crew communicates, how they talk to each other, how they make decisions how they develop and maintain situation awareness. And it followed the disaster in Tenerife in the Canary Islands. Anybody familiar with that? Um, it was two 747s colliding on the runway and uh, tremendous loss of life. I forget the exact number. I want to say it's over 600. Uh, it, I believe is still the largest single aviation uh, mishap in, in aviation history. How did it happen? It's worth kind of looking at. First of all, both planes were at an unscheduled airport. There had been a bomb threat at the original airport where both were headed to in Spain. And so they were sent to Tenerife uh, just as a temporary backup airport while they um, determined the nature of the threat there in Spain. The airport had many more planes than it was designed to handle. It wasn't equipped with a ground radar. They had to, to get the planes to land and take off, they had to do what's called a back taxi, where you land and then turn around and go back down the runway to get to the, um, to the uh, gate. You don't actually have a, a taxi ramp to go down. 
Uh, both crews were tired. They'd been flying well above their normal allotted hours. They were irritable. That's actually um, what you can tell from some of the voice recordings before the crash. And they were in a hurry to get back on schedule. And then to make matters even worse, the fog rolled in as planes began to leave. And then the final piece of the puzzle is that the captain of the KLM flight was viewed as intimidating and he was considered an expert and nobody dare question his judgment. So what do you see here? Is this, do you see a single catastrophic event or do you see a series of little things that by themselves probably wouldn't have been a big deal, but you line them up and you can see where this is going. What ended up happening is um, another plane was told to take off and the KLM pilot wasn't. And he said, you know what? In essence, forget this, we're going, take off. And he ordered the first officer to start the process and the planes collided on the runway. So this led to uh, the development of what's called the Swiss cheese model of disasters. James Reason, psychologist, um, you know, came up with this back, I think, in the, in the 70s or early 80s. Actually, in this book, which is 91, um, is when it probably became prominent. And it's this notion that disasters in any realm are usually not the result of some cataclysmically bad decision. Instead, a disaster results when you have gaps in institutional um, rules, organizational processes, team collaboration, individual knowledge, fatigue, and then you have perhaps breakdowns in, in technology. Either any one of these on their own, eh, it's just inconvenient. Line them up and it can be the path from real world uh, events to a disaster. And this was fascinating to me because as, as I started thinking about some of the events that either I worked that didn't go well or that I was aware of, this fits perfectly. And so it started a lot of us thinking about, well, what are those organizational challenges? What are the layers of cheese that we deal with in meteorology and how do we, how do we address them? And one of them really boils down to how do you make decisions under time pressure? And in many aspects of life, whether it's driving a car home today and, and having to make a quick decision because of somebody's actions in front of you or as a weather forecaster or, or in whatever job and profession you end up pursuing, um, making decisions is the key of it. I think it was Napoleon who said nothing is more critical and therefore as valuable as the ability to decide. And sometimes in meteorology you make the decision not to do something and that's just as crucial. And so we started looking at decision styles and I'll bet you there are as many different styles as there are people but really it started to boil down to a couple of different uh, types of decision makers. One, the so-called analytical decision maker who wants details, who wants uh, time to evaluate options, who wants um, as much information as possible. And then there's the intuitive decision maker who can look at something and within a couple seconds say, here's what you gotta do. And then you start thinking, well, so are they, these differences innate? Are they a function of experience? And it turns out they are largely a function of experience and training. And I think a mistake that we might have made early on in looking at this is that it, you either are one or the other. But for most of us, it's, it's, it's elements of both. And the more experience you get in any discipline, uh, including weather forecasting, the more you switch from an analytical to an intuitive decision maker. And the essence of expertise and intuition is really experience and learning from it. And so that's one of the cool things about this class is not only are you learning theory, but you're applying it. And so in reality, when you come out of this class, you've got real world experience that most folks don't get until they've been in the job for years. So really um, envy that you've had this opportunity, wish it had been around uh, a few decades ago, uh, and I think it'll benefit you well. Um, another aspect to decision making is the asymmetric penalty function. This idea that um, you know, decision costs are not equal. If you issue a warning and not much happens, well, people will say, well, maybe we were lucky, it missed us. If you don't issue it, and something bad happens, it becomes a Washington Post you know, front page story and you don't want that to happen. Or to have the 60 Minutes truck pull up and want to ask you some questions about that day on the job. Um, so asymmetric penalty function is something that's never really far from our mind. We try not to let it dictate our actions, but as humans, it inevitably does that. Uh, decision biases play a big role. You know, the, the, how the last event worked out, man, I got burned really bad going after this event. I'm gonna be more conservative the next time. Maybe that's not what you need to do. So past events, uh, your conceptual models, your ability to um, 
take more recent information and change that conceptual model, that skill varies for all of us. And then this is where I answer the question I proposed sort of rhetorically. I believe multitasking really is a myth. Um, there was a period of time where we thought we've got to teach people how to multitask, how to do lots of different things simultaneously. And it turns out what we were trying to do is to get you to do serial tasking but switch quickly. And what it ends up doing is degrading decision quality and making it incrementally more likely that you're going to make the wrong decision, which potentially could lead to disaster. A lot of this early work was done with uh, fire ground commanders. They found that the best fire ground commanders almost could make decisions as they were pulling up to a scene. You know, and what was it about that that allowed them to do it? Well, part of it was experience, seeing the scene as they approached it, and they knew right away, we got to call for a second alarm, third alarm. We've got to get the firefighters out. That building's about to collapse. And that intuitive ability really allowed them to make decisions effectively and very quickly. Um, another example is in aviation and also in military warfare. And so we, you know, those of us that were involved in these workshops in Boulder started thinking, well, how do we pull that training into meteorology? And how do we do, do that in a way that develops expertise? First, let me define what expertise is. Um, it's not simply a function of experience. Doing a job 30 years doesn't make you an expert. Doing it with active learning and feedback on that job can potentially make you an expert. So it's really, it's a deep level of knowledge within that subject domain. Um, not routine expertise, but it's an ability to handle uh, any situation that you might imagine effectively. Most experts would say it takes at least 10 years of experience with active learning and feedback on your decisions to develop expertise. Um, and so what can we learn from other disciplines? This is the one that I'll never forget. It really sticks in my mind as I read the report. Uh, you may not remember, and some of this was you know, well back before you were probably watching the news, but in 1996, there was an accident on the Washington Metro uh, Railway. Um, essentially, you had two trains in one train's spot. And what happened is the top train um, didn't stop in time. There was already a train there, and so it went over the first train, and it uh, caused a number of fatalities. And as I read the, uh, the report on what happened, they had made it a rule within the, the Washington Metro uh, Transit Authority that operators would rely on automation to use the brakes and only step in in an emergency. How do you develop expertise to know when an emergency comes or is about to happen when you don't have routine experience using the brakes? And what happened was after that, they changed the rules to allow the operators to actually manually have influence over the brakes so that they could develop the expertise and know when that crisis was perhaps about to occur. But 10 years ago, I was at the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Global Headquarters in Fort Worth, um, and they practice, um, they, had, they had dispatchers there that covered all the trains across North America. And they, as the tour progressed, they said, well, we practice what's called exception management. We rely on automated output to teach or to tell our dispatchers what's happening, and they're only trained to step in in a crisis. Apparently, they had gotten pretty good at it, but I, I left wondering, well, how do you know when a crisis is developing if the automation is in control and you're just sort of doing whatever you're doing routinely when things are working properly. And I think that's true in weather forecasting too, especially in an era where we get so much guidance. How do you know when the guidance is wrong if you're just blindly trusting it all the time? And this is why it's important to look at observational data. It's important to be an active participant in the forecast process and it's critical to get verification, to learn from that experience so that you know Perhaps when you go to work tomorrow, today is not a day to trust the models, and it's not a day to trust the guidance. And then the importance of communication, uh, I think we knew it was critical, but as we started looking at other disciplines and finding out where it led to failure, or in this case, averted an even more catastrophic outcome, we realized that um, we've got to spend time talking about communications, teamwork, the, the ability to have people that might have, you might have the MIC in the office, you might have an intern. That intern has to know that, hey, it's okay for you to question the boss's judgment. Politely would be preferred, but you know, we're all fallible. Everyone should be, feel comfortable speaking up. And the example of this was United Airlines Flight 232 going from Denver to Chicago in the summer of 1989. They had a catastrophic hydraulic failure that led to the initially the inability of the flight crew to control the path of the aircraft. 
I, mean, I don't know what your definition of a bad day is, but if I'm an airline pilot, this is a bad day. Um, and it got even worse because they got on the phone to the, uh, to the United uh, Maintenance folks and they said, you know what, <laughs> we don't have a plan. We can't help you, sorry. We have no training to tell you what to do in this situation. So the captain who survived the crash, as did um, 189 of the passengers on the plane, turned to his crew and said, I don't care what's your rank, you got an idea, let me hear it. And they actually brought an off-duty pilot into the, into the um, cabin and said the same thing to him. Help us out, let's just troubleshoot. And the captain said later that not having a, a guidebook or a plan actually helped them because they could just think entirely you know, off the cuff. And it turns out over the course of the next few minutes, they came up with an idea of how to control the plane sufficiently so that they could hurl towards the airport too fast, but they had some control and they were able to save some of the passengers' lives. In a recording of that that was analyzed by the guy you see at the bottom here, Stephen Predmore, he plotted the exchange of information as a function of time and found that at its peak, and it could be something as simple as just a uh-huh, huh, you know, any kind of utterance to uh, words or complete sentences, is that it was off the charts. The level of communication was unprecedented in any previous study that they had looked at. Now, whether that made the difference or just contributed to a better outcome than what you could have imagined is hard to say. But the captain said the ability to just have that conversation and to exchange information in his mind was key to having a positive outcome. And I think in a weather office where we're all at our own workstations, sometimes we're separated by some distance, it's easy just to get locked at the screens you're looking at, the data you're looking at, and type away, make that forecast. But having the ability to talk to your coworkers and to not feel afraid to ask them a question or to seek their guidance is really a valuable state of mind. And then the other aspect of, of um, decision making that we began, quickly became aware of as being critical is this idea of situation awareness. First heard about this term in 1988. Again, it was in the aviation realm. Um, and we actually were fortunate to have one of the founders of the situation awareness uh, construct come to our workshops and talk to us. Her husband was, an, uh, was originally a military pilot, then became an airline pilot, and so she had first-hand experience of applying this. And the aspects of it that, that really stuck with me were that there are three levels of SA that are critical. One is being aware that some piece of information is out there. Second is being aware that it's important to you. And third is being able to realize that you need to project how that piece of information is going to change in the next few minutes, few hours, perhaps few days, and what that means in terms of the forecast or warning decision making. And so it really breaks down situation awareness into training in recognition, projection, and, and understanding the value or relevance of that information. And once you begin to understand those key components of situation awareness, you can, as a, as a science officer in an office, as someone doing applied research, start to attack the problem in those specific areas. If information is there, but you don't recognize it's important, it doesn't matter. So there's really some detail here in situation awareness um, that can affect how you train in a modern weather forecast office. I would also say that situation awareness is, a, is affected by fatigue. It's affected by workload, your mental model. How you can identify fatigue in a coworker, obviously, if they're staring up at the sky or twiddling their pen, they're, they're, they're distracted. If they repeatedly ask you to repeat what you've told them, um, if they are starting to just stare at you sort of vacuously and like they're having trouble comprehending, over the course of time, you can look at that person and say, you need to take a break. And I've actually done that before in a, in a forecast environment. In a warning environment, you can spend, hours can go by in the span of minutes. It's actually incredible. There, there have been some days where I've been at work 20 hours. And when I got up to leave, I could not believe I'd been there that long. Um, and you're the last person to recognize when you're tired. And if, if you're like me, you love meteorology, you have to pry my fingers off the mouse at the warning desk. I love it, I wanna keep doing it. I'll fall asleep telling you I'm fine. So others have to look at you and say, hey, take a break, go get some coffee, uh, do something else, maybe answer the phones for a while. Fatigue is at the point where it's really becoming distracting.